Hello again. Um, today we're going to look at several key uh, people and events uh, which links back to the Catholic threats that we were looking at last time. First of all, we're going to look at Mary Queen of Scots, who she was in a bit more detail and why she posed such a threat and um, why she had a legitimate claim to the throne. We'll then look at plots involving her and attempts to overthrow Elizabeth. And finally, we'll have a look at Francis Walsingham, who was Elizabeth's spy master and how he was able to intercept these threats and uh, expose the plots to get rid of Elizabeth over time. Now, uh, on the screen now, you can see a family tree, a Tudor family tree. I'm going to use this to explain how Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth are related. So what I'd like you to do based on this is just write a brief description or explanation about how the two are related. So Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth. One thing I just want to mention briefly is that it's important we realise that Mary Queen of Scots and Mary I are different people. Mary I is Bloody Mary. She's the uh, Queen before Elizabeth in England and is Henry VIII's first child. Mary Queen of Scots uh, is different. She is the granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister Margaret. And so it's important that we know that they are both different people. I know sometimes with having the same name it can be quite confusing. What's helpful for us is that both of them are Catholics, so both of the Marys are Catholics, and we can use that to help us remember their different religious views. So just briefly then, at the top you can see Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, his wife, and their four children. So you've got Arthur, Henry, Margaret and Mary. Now Arthur dies um, before he's able to become king. Henry VIII comes to the throne and you can see his wives and his children here. So you've got Mary, then Elizabeth, then Edward. So you can see Elizabeth is the granddaughter of Henry VII. And if you go along from Henry VIII to his sister Margaret, you can see her descendants in her family tree. Uh, and we can then link Mary Queen of Scots, who's in that family tree, back to Henry. So you have Margaret, who marries James IV of Scotland. So Scotland and England are separate countries at this point. Um, and they have a child called James, who marries Mary of Guise, who is one of the uh, dominant French families. And they have a daughter, Mary Queen of Scots, who becomes Queen of Scotland in 1542. Um, and so as we can see here, if you go back from Mary Queen of Scots up the family tree, you can see that Henry VII is her great-grandfather. So you've got uh, James V is her father, then James IV is her grandfather, and then Henry VIII is her maternal great-grandfather. And so what you can see here is the link. So you've got Elizabeth and Mary being distant cousins. Um, and that's why Mary Queen of Scots has a legitimate claim to the throne, because you can directly go from her all the way to Henry VII. Um, and so she is kind of the main Catholic heir to the English throne after Elizabeth. What we're going to do next is have a look at Mary's early life, uh, the ups and downs in her life, and explain why, by the end of the 1560s, she is based in England and is posing such an important threat to Elizabeth. And so now we're going to uh, look at some of the events of Mary's life. And we're going to create a, a living graph to show why she becomes a threat to Elizabeth, but also going to be looking at the ups and downs of her life. So when was life looking good for Mary? And when did more native things happen? So, on the left-hand side, you've got a series of bits of information uh, from 1558, which is when Elizabeth comes to power, through to 68, when Mary has to escape Scotland and come down to uh, England, where she's eventually put under house arrest. And so what I'd like to do, the task of this bit, is to read through the information, Add the events onto a graph, so you have the dates along the x-axis, along the bottom, and then plot on the using the y-axis how good or bad her life is at these different points. So if her life is good at a particular time, then you can put a little cross and plot a point higher up, and if it's going not very well and going badly, then somewhere further down. Um, and so by the end of this, you'll have an overview of this 10 year period and how her life has changed from the start of it to the end. I'm not going to read through all of it, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase and summarise bits of it. So we start off 
5058. Um, Mary's been living in France, uh, having a very Catholic education for some time. She is married to the French heir, the heir to the French throne. And relations between Scotland and France, the Catholic connection is very strong. So in the first year of Elizabeth's reign, the Catholic connection between Scotland and France is a very strong one. Um, and in 59, Mary's husband becomes the King of France and that enhances her power. But back at home in Scotland, there is a civil war between Catholics and Protestants. And the Protestants end up winning, partly because Elizabeth backs them. Uh, and so, although she is in a strong position uh, as the wife of the King of France, her position is weakened slightly because uh, back at home in Scotland, the Protestants are now, now in charge. And this becomes more of a problem in 61. Uh, Francis II dies, her husband, and she returns to Scotland widowed, and also in a weaker political position because the nobles, the influential political people in Scotland, um, were largely Protestant. She also, in 64, refuses to marry the Earl of Leicester, and Elizabeth suggests the Earl of Leicester uh, for Mary to marry for a couple of reasons. Um, one, he's a Protestant. Two, he's very loyal to Elizabeth, and he knows that, and she knows that he won't form plots against her. And so it's a way uh, of Elizabeth kind of Keeping, a, keeping an eye on Mary and making sure that she can't uh, become too powerful. However, she ignores this. She marries Lord Darnley, who is a Catholic and also has links to the Tudor uh, family tree. And so this enhances her claim to the throne because her, combined with her new husband, Darnley, uh, they now have a quite significant, um, a significant link to the English throne and are now more of a threat. And this makes Elizabeth very angry. Uh, by 66, Darnley wants more power. He's a very abusive husband. He's abusive towards Mary and he kills David Rizzio, who's one of Mary's uh, closest friends um, and his secretary. Um, and shortly after this, Mary has their child, James, who becomes James VI of Scotland later on and also James I of England after Elizabeth dies. And although they've got now this male heir, which again makes her more of a threat because Elizabeth doesn't have an heir, Mary hates her husband. And by 67, Darnley's dead. His house has been blown up. It looks like he's been strangled. And Mary and her new lover, the Earl of Bothwell, have been seen as involved in the murder. And this results in Mary's imprisonment in Scotland and Bothwell leaving the country. By 68, Mary escapes from prison, which is obviously a good thing for her, but she's defeated in battle and um, is forced to flee to England to the mercy of her cousin, Queen Elizabeth, who puts her into house arrest. So we can see, all in all, I think it's fair to say, a pretty bad 10 years for Mary, who goes from being in a position where she is married to the heir of France, strong Catholic ties, Scotland's still largely Catholic, and the end where she's been widowed twice, where she has lost the Scottish throne and Scotland is now dominated by Protestants. She's now at the mercy of her cousin Elizabeth, who previously, remember, she said shouldn't be queen and that she should be queen. And so you can see it's uh, putting Mary in quite a difficult position. Now what we're going to do now, once you've done your graph, is we're going to move on to the next few slides where we'll look at revolts and plots, which involve for removal of Elizabeth and the introduction of Mary Queen of Scots as Queen in England. Okay then, so the first of the uh, plots or revolts we're going to look at is called the Northern Revolt. Okay, so this happens in 1569. Um, and it happens, as it, uh, the uh, information on this slide suggests, for two main reasons, political and religious reasons. And part of it is down to uh, Thomas Percy, the person in that picture there, he is the Earl of Northumberland, which if you remember back to our map from a couple of uh, sessions ago, um, is one of the areas which is quite strongly Catholic. Okay, um, And him and other important earls, like the Earl of Westmoreland, Charles Neville, um, are very angry at Elizabeth for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at religious factors, and then we're going to have a look at political factors. Now, in terms of how you're setting this out, you can maybe do it as a table of political and religious factors, 
or you can just simply note take and highlight those causes which are Protestant, highlight, sorry, highlight the causes which are religious and highlight the causes which are political. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of these different factors that led to the Northern Revolt now. So, first of all, the people who led the Northern Revolt, like the Earl of Northumberland, wanted to re return England to Catholicism. In other words, to bring the Catholic Church back uh, as the dominant church in England. And you can't do that with Elizabeth on the throne. You can't do that as she's there as a Protestant queen who sees herself as head of the church. And as a Catholic, he thinks that the Pope should be in charge and that the church should be more elaborate and church services be in Latin, etc. And that's a belief common amongst a lot of the nobles, especially in the north of England. So that looks at the religious factors. Um, however, there are other factors at play as well, largely political. Now, one of the reasons for this is that people like Northumberland and the Earl of Westmoreland, they had been very dominant in the court of Mary I. They had been very powerful, they had a lot of influence. But when Elizabeth came in, they lost some of this influence, partly because of their strong Catholic beliefs, but also because of um, the introduction of new families, people like William Cecil. Now, William Cecil, as we know, is Secretary of State under Elizabeth, the most important person in the Privy Council, but he wasn't from a noble family. He's from a very well-off family, he'd been very well educated, but he's seen as like a new noble. Whereas people like um, Thomas Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, had been in a long, long line of very, very powerful landowners and nobles. And so the idea of these new people popping up like Cecil um, and Robert Dudley, who is the Queen's favourite, uh, upset him quite a lot. This is the same, not just for Northumberland and Westmoreland, and we call them those because they are named after the places where they were from. You also have Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk. Now, Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, Norfolk was a Protestant, so the religion element didn't come into it quite as much. But he was from another ancient old northern family. And he didn't like, again, these kind of these new people in the court with lots of power, people like William Cecil, people like Robert Dudley. He didn't like these new people having power. And so he agrees to become part of a plot which involves him marrying Mary, Queen of Scots. And then it also involves uh, Northumberland and Westmoreland raising an army in the north and marching south towards London to claim the throne. Uh, so that's some information about the causes of the Northern Revolt. We've looked a bit about religious factors, so the return to Catholicism. Um, and then we also have the political factors as well. The fact that uh, people like Westmoreland, people like the Earl of Northumberland had lost uh, political power. And that people like the Duke of Norfolk didn't like new people like William Cecil and Robert Dudley having um, a lot of influence over Elizabeth in her court. And so that gives us some of those key causes of the Northern Revolt. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at some of the events of the revolt. So if you pause the video and then we will look next at the events of the Northern Revolt and how it played out. So as you can see here, we have a map of the north of England. Um, and on that map, we've got various different points. We've got some annotations there of the different events of the Northern Revolt. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a read and listen to the information on here. And what you're going to do is create a timeline of events starting on the 9th of November, 1569, and going through to the 19th of December. And so by the end of this, you'll have this timeline of the events of the, of the Northern Revolt. It's early successes and an eventual failure. So I'm gonna just start and go through these annotations in order. It's just worth bearing in mind that point two actually comes before the end of point one on your timeline. So point two happens on the 14th of November, the end of point one happens on the 16th. So bear that in mind when adding your information to the timeline. Number one, on the 9th of November at midnight, the bells are rung at the Earl of Northumberland's residence at Topcliffe to start the rebellion. The Earl of Westmoreland's forces are assembled near Durham. 
On the 13th, the Earl of Sussex begins a response to raise troops to go north, uh, but few people are willing to join him. And as a result of this, on the 16th, he writes to a Privy Council to get help with raising enough troops from the Privy Council of the Queen's closest advisers. On the 14th of November, Northumberland and Westmoreland have seized Durham Cathedral and hear mass. Now, this is important. It's probably one of the most important events of the Northern Revolt. Uh, and it's really important also to because it links with the causes. So one of the causes we looked at was about religion and a return to Catholicism that Northumberland and Westmoreland wanted. And one of the reasons they, was, they felt so strongly about this was because um, a man called James Pilkington had been appointed as Archbishop of uh, Durham Cathedral by Elizabeth in 61. And he was a Protestant and he was deeply, deeply unpopular with many people in the North because they were more Catholic than areas in the South. And so by taking over the cathedral and having a Catholic service in the cathedral, it was a direct challenge to Elizabeth's authority and a direct challenge to the religious settlement uh, 10 years before. Point number three, on the 22nd of November, all of the northern, in sorry, all of North England east of the Pennines and as far south as Braham Moor is controlled by the rebels. So you can see a huge amount of the north of England is dominated by the rebels. So they've taken over large amounts of land and they've, they're trying to consolidate their power. On the 30th of November, some rebels divert to capture Hartlepool, hoping that the Spanish help will arrive at the port, but it doesn't. So part of the plan that Northumberland came up with was to take Dome Cathedral, seize land in the north, um, and then get Spanish assistance, Spanish military assistance. So by taking Hartlepool on the coast, as you can see on the map, he hoped that he could get the uh, Spanish troops uh, to assist in the rebellion, but they don't turn up. Um, and this starts to show the beginning of the end for, for the rebellion because they kind of need this Spanish assistance, but they keep going regardless. Number five, on the 14th of December, the rebels take Barnard Castle in County Durham. So a significant uh, capture by the rebels. They take a castle. And again, they're consolidating their power in the north. Point six. Uh, on the 16th of December, 14,000 men march for Elizabeth from the south. They reach River Tees. Rebel forces flee north because they are vastly outnumbered. There's 14,000 in favour of Elizabeth and only 5,400 in favour of the northern earls. And so they flee and the northern earls lose their army. That means on the 19th, three days later, Northumberland and Westmoreland cross into Scotland and the rebellion is defeated. So Westmoreland and um, Northumberland have been defeated. The Duke of Norfolk in this time has decided against the plan, which would have involved him marrying Mary, Queen of Scots, um, and tries to talk them out of it, very refuse. And so you can see here that the Northern Revolt is brought to an end. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video, create your timeline, and then we'll move on to briefly looking at the consequences of the Northern Revolt. So now we've looked at the uh, causes and events of the Northern Revolt. We're now just going to briefly look at the consequences. Now I've displayed mine here as a mind map. You can do that if you wish, or you can do it in another way if you prefer. Um, I'm going to go through them one by one and just explain them through. And by the end, hopefully, we just have a written, a brief written summary of the different consequences of the Northern Revolt in 1569. Uh, so let's start with one at the top there. So increased scope of treason and harsher laws. So as a result of the Northern Revolt, um, the punishments of treason, for instance, for treason are uh, increased. Um, there are harsher laws for those rebels involved, and many of these rebels are executed, including Northumberland. So Northumberland is executed at York, he's captured and executed at York, demonstrating these harsh punishments of those involved, those involved with plots. On the left-hand side, it's, it highlighted the extent of the Catholic threat at home. It's the first time there's been a major rebellion in England under Elizabeth's reign. And it shows that there's a lot of bad feeling towards Elizabeth, particularly in the north of England. And so one of the consequences of the Northern Revolt is just highlighting for Elizabeth and her advisers how significant this threat at home is. 
And as we look at some of the future assassination attempts and plots against Elizabeth, we can see a lot of them involve, at least in part, Catholic threats from home. And so the Northern Revolt really kind of highlights to Elizabeth why this was so significant. We then go on to the uh, point on the right-hand side to so increase suppression of Catholics, for instance, the Council of the North. So the Council of the North is set up in 1572 by the Earl of Huntington, who's a very uh, strict Protestant, very strong Protestant. And he sets up the Council of the North. And this was used to make sure that Elizabeth's laws were being upheld um, as it was far away from London. So when we looked at a map a few lessons ago where most Catholics lived and which areas were mostly Catholic. You can see the further away from London you go, the more Catholic it's likely to be. And so the Council of the North was there to try and um, be a focal point for law enforcement in the north of England to make sure that Elizabeth's laws are being followed. Um, it also had special powers that could take action in times of lawlessness and emergency. So it meant that um, the, Earl, the Earl of Huntington was able to use quite significant powers to suppress any rebellions that were to come up in the north again. And so we don't, wouldn't have that problem that the Earl of Sussex had, as we saw on the last slide, where it took him a while to raise troops. The final uh, consequence is, the, is Elizabeth's excommunication. So as a result of the Northern Revolt, the execution of significant Catholics and rebels such as Northumberland, the Pope decided to excommunicate Elizabeth, in other words, kick her out of the church. And that sent a direct instruction to Catholics in England that they shouldn't obey Elizabeth's rules and laws, and that she was not a rightful queen, and that she should be deposed and replaced. Now this is a major turning point, if you like, between relations between Catholics in, in England against Elizabeth, because they now had a choice they could either obey the Queen, who they religiously disagree with, or they listen to the Pope and they have to try and work to get rid of Elizabeth because she is following a path of heresy against the Catholic Church and not following the Catholic teachings of the Pope. So Elizabeth's excommunication creates further suspicion of Catholics because there is now a very strong signal sent to Catholics by the Pope saying that you need to get rid of Elizabeth. She does not follow the right religion, she is a heretic, and she needs to be removed. And so this means that Catholics at home are now going to pose more of a threat because they have a direct instruction from the Pope, their spiritual leader. What I'd like to do now is pause the video again, summarise these consequences for me, and then we'll start looking at these different Catholic plots. So we're now going to look at the plots against Elizabeth. Uh, we're going to do this in chronological order, so we'll start with the Rodolfi plot, 1571. And what we're going to do is, by the end of this, we'll have a profile for the four rebellions and plots. So we'll have the Northern Revolt, which we've already looked at, the Rodolfi plot, the Throckmorton plot, and the Barrington plot. And what we're going to have by the end, as I say, is a summary of each. And also, we're going to rank them in order of which was the greatest threat. So out of these different plots, which ones posed the greatest threats? We can also look at similarities and differences. So what do these different plots have in common? So what I'm going to do for each of these remaining plots is just briefly summarise them, who was involved, what the plan was, what the plot was, and the consequences. Uh, and then once we've done that, we can create our summaries and then decide which ones were more significant than others. So the Rodolfi plot in 1571. Rodolfi was an Italian banker living in England. He was also a spy for the Pope. So he's an Italian in England who's spying for the papacy, for the Pope. And the plan involved the Duke of Norfolk to start an uprising. And if you remember, he was involved in a previous uh, revolt, but pulled out at the last minute. He secured the support of the Pope and Philip of Spain, who had 10,000 men stationed in the Netherlands under the Duke of Alba. Elizabeth would be killed and Mary, Queen of Scots, put on the throne and marry Norfolk. So Norfolk signed up to the plot because... He eventually be married to the Queen, puts him in a very strong position. So that's the plan. However, William Cecil, Elizabeth's spy master and Secretary of State, found out about the plot. He had a series of spies able to uncover what was going on. Rodolfi was abroad, so he couldn't be captured, but the Duke of Norfolk was captured, arrested and executed. Um, now many of Elizabeth's advisors wanted him to do this, wanted to, um, this to happen, sorry to him. 
after the Northern Revolt, but Elizabeth refused. But now it's clear that he was part of another plot, he has to be executed. It also shows that Mary Queen of Scots is a very significant threat. It's the second time that she's been involved in a plot to get rid of and overthrow Elizabeth. The final reason why this is significant is because it shows Spain and the Pope being able to and agreeing to work alongside English Catholics in order to remove Elizabeth. And as a result of this, as a consequence of this, Elizabeth wants to try and improve relations with France so that she has an ally in the region to help her against Spain. So that's the Rodolfi plot. We're now going to move on to the Throckmorton plot. So the next plot we're going to look at is the Throckmorton plot, so 1583, so a considerable amount of time after the Rodolfi plot. Francis Throckmorton was a young English noble and was a link of communication between Mary Queen of Scots and the French Duke of Guise. Now, uh, the Duke of Guise was related to Mary Queen of Scots, and you can refer back to our family tree at the start to demonstrate this. The plan was uh, that the Duke of Guise would invade England, put Mary on the throne, and make England Catholic again. And they'd have financial support from Spain, and religious and spiritual support and consent given by the Pope. Now, this plot again was uncovered using Elizabeth Spymaster's network, and in this case, the Spymaster was Francis Walsingham, who we'll look at in more detail in a moment. But he found incriminating papers in the possession of Throckmorton, who was arrested, tortured, and executed in May 84. And he was hung, drawn, and courted, which was the death of a traitor. And this plot highlighted a couple of things. First of all, the letters that Throckmorton had had a series of of names of Catholic sympathisers who were willing to help remove Elizabeth. So it highlighted the threat at home and would have increased um, the kind of suspicion and policing, if you like, of Catholics in England. This led to the number of priest holes increasing as punishments for harbouring priests also increased. So harsh punishments if you were trying to hide a Catholic priest. Now priest holes are ingenious kind of uh, hideaways for priests to have in the households of Catholics. So it might be in floorboards, might be in walls, might be behind bookcases, all sorts of different things. That is probably a good thing to Google because there's lots of really interesting ones. It also highlighted the combined threat of Spain and France, which made Elizabeth fearful and worried about what would happen if these two foreign powers combined to overthrow her again and her spy masters might not necessarily be able to um, stop the next plot. So it made her very concerned about her vulnerable position. So the final plot we're going to look at is the Babington plot uh, from 1586. And this involved Anthony Babington, um, an English Catholic who sent plans of the plot to Mary Queen of Scots. Mary responded and agreed in secret coded letters. We're gonna look at um, how these were broken in a moment. Now, the plan was that Mary would be freed and Elizabeth would be killed by six assassins. The Duke of Guise would then invade with 60,000 men and would be supported by Philip of Spain and the Pope. So again, we have a combination of these things that Elizabeth was already worried about. English Catholics in Anthony Babington and his six assassins. Mary, Queen of Scots, as a Catholic heir to the throne, someone who can take over. And also the combined might of France through Duke of Guise, Spain through financial support of Philip II and the spiritual support of the Pope. So it's almost like a perfect storm. If this plot's successful, it's going to do so because it combines a threat of English Catholics, Mary Queen of Scots and foreign threats. However, unfortunately for Mary Queen of Scots and the rest of the plotters, things do not go well for them as we'll see next. So, the outcome of this plot um, is that Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's spy master, is able to not just demonstrate that the assassins were guilty, but also that Mary Queen of Scots was guilty. And this resulted in the assassins, including Anthony Babington, being hung, drawn and courted, and Mary Queen of Scots was also executed and beheaded after being tried by the Privy Council. And this is um, significant because obviously this didn't happen with the previous plots. The reason for this is because this time Mary Queen of Scots is caught red-handed. 
Her and Babington have been sending letters to each other, which have been written in code that only they can understand. And in these secret letters, Mary says quite clearly that she supports the uh, assassination of Elizabeth and Elizabeth's removal from power. Now, obviously, this is treason, a crime against the, against the crown, against the queen. And Walsingham, Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's spymaster, is able to decrypt this code using a cipher. And there's an example of a cipher here, which shows different symbols uh, representing different letters. And these would be used to help break the coded letters. And this was then used as evidence to uh, try Mary and have her executed. Now, this has several really key consequences. Uh, largely, the fact that relations with Spain almost utterly collapse. This happens for two reasons. One, the death of Mary, Queen of Scots, shows that Elizabeth is killed, the person who Philip of Spain and the Pope feel is the legitimate Queen of England. They think that Mary, Queen of Scots, should be on the throne, but Elizabeth shouldn't be. And Elizabeth has just gone and executed the person who is the rightful heir to the throne, according to Catholics. Along with this, Elizabeth is also interfering in the Netherlands, which is um, under the occupation of Spanish troops. And so therefore, that's going to make Philip of Spain incredibly angry. Along with this, Mary's death also meant there, were no, there was no longer a Catholic heir. And so therefore, Philip is going to have to take it on himself to overcome Elizabeth, take over the country and introduce Catholicism himself. And we'll see that with the Spanish Armada. Finally, there is increased persecution of Catholics. More Catholics are arrested and 31 priests are executed in the immediate aftermath. And again, this shows increased measures to reduce the influence of Catholicism in England. So what we now have is a summary of the different plots and revolts. What I'd like you to do is put these in order of significance. So the most important on one end and the least significant on the other. Once you've done that, I'd also like you to try and kind of pinpoint areas of similarity between the plots and areas of differences. So is there anything that runs through two or more of these plots? For instance, Mary Queen of Scots involvement. Are there any areas which change as the plots progress? Once you've done that, we're going to go on to our final section of this video, looking at Francis Walsingham and his spy network. So this is our final section today, looking more specifically at Francis Walsingham and his spy network. Now, he took over from William Cecil as Secretary of State after uh, previously working for Cecil and also being an MP. And he was able to improve and enhance the spy network, which was there to protect Elizabeth from foreign and internal threats. Now, I'm not going to read through all this information because um, I think it's probably best if you just pause the video, read through key elements and even and note them down to some kind of revision format. However, what I would also like you to do uh, as a task is write a job description for Walsingham's successor, so a person who takes over. If you are going to take over from Walsingham, what skills will you need and what kind of jobs will you have to do? And by doing this, we'll be able to uh, summarise effectively his key role as Secretary of State and Spymaster, whether it's intercepting and uh, decrypting letters whether it's managing a network of spies around both England and internationally, influencing politicians, searching the houses of foreigners, interrogating plotters like Francis Throckmorton, who was put on the rack, uh, of which there was only one in the country, in the Tower of London, and capturing priests coming into the country to stop them spreading the Catholic message. All of these elements are important um, to Walsingham's role. And so your job is going to be to create a job description for his success of a person who will take over from him. Once you've done this, we've completed this section on uh, th threats posed by Mary Queen of Scots and the plots, and I look forward to seeing you next time.